Light and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. It is not ourselves that we proclaim. We proclaim Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the same God who said, Out of darkness let light shine, has caused his light to shine within us, to give the light of revelation, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the lamp of charity which never fails, that it may burn in us and shed its light on those around us, and that by its brightness we may have a vision of that holy city where dwells the true and never-failing light, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lumen ad revelationem gentium et gloria plebis tu Israel. Lumen ad revelationem gentium and Gloria, plebis to Israel. Lumen ad revelationem gentium. And Gloria, plebis to Israel. O oh, gracious light, your brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Amen. Well, welcome everybody, and welcome back, Matthew, again. This evening, we're going to start our lesson series on uh, stages of faith. Stages of faith was put together by James Fowler, who was a professor at Emory. And uh, Fowler's stages of faith itself was based on the moral stage theory of Lawrence Kohlberg and Carol Gilligan which itself was based off of the stage theory of cognitive development put together by the likes of Piaget and others. So in order to get up to Fowler, I've got to first give you a background or as quick a synopsis as I can on what moral stage theory is that led to stages of faith that Fowler was able to apply. Uh, as I said, in uh, Lawrence Kohlberg and Carol Gilligan, uh, their moral stage theory is where you have stages, uh, designated stages of development that you can define some by age in their development uh, from childhood to adolescence and other by development through adulthood if you reach that stage. This itself was based off of Piaget and others and their cognitive development of early adolescence and childhood development. Piaget pointed out that you could look at across, relatively across cultures, um, a distinct development of complex thought from infancy through adolescence that was all developed with or dependent on the physical development of the brain. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, for instance, does not finish its development until your mid-twenties. So as the brain is continuing to um, grow and develop, you have new neural pathways that allow for new trains of thought, new methods of thinking. 
And it was this stage theory that uh, Lawrence Kohlberg then picked up on for stage development, for moral stage development. And then Carol Gilligan, one of his students, critiqued and offered a feminist view. So with that in mind, let me walk you through the stage theory that Lawrence Kohlberg put together. First, a few parameters. Keep in mind that this is, in fact, theory. That as with every theory, you have those that will hold to it, you have others that will rebuke it. After all, Lawrence Kohlberg had his theory, Carol Gilligan came back, said, no, that's not inclusive of the feminist voice, therefore here's a new theory. Each one develops, but each one has its own truth. Each one is tried out uh, with extensive testing. So all of these have been tried in the field. All of these different stage theories have had tremendous amounts of feedback, and a lot of these have been around for decades and decades. So they have developed in their own understanding and their own practice. The other thing about stage theory is this. When you move into moral stage theory, and most importantly, when we get to stages of faith, when you have stages, it's easy to understand, and you often see this in Kohlberg, that it's assumed that you will move from one stage to the next stage. That because it is progressive from one to six, it is assumed you should be progressing, and therefore a higher stage is a higher level and a superior level of development as opposed to those that come before it. The problem is this. Whenever you have moral theory, and then when we get into faith stages, this is all bound by culture. You are bound by a cultural language, and this is part of what Carol Gilligan critiqued with Kohlberg is that you are bound by a culture, and if it's predominantly men that are winning out in the stage theory, then you're losing the culture of feminism. So Carol Gilligan had her alternative. If you look at the moral stage theory of the Western world, it is going to be different from the moral stage theory of the Eastern world. The difference between a collective being superior versus the individual being superior. So as with all moral theory, stage or otherwise, you have to understand that it's still to a degree relative. <coughs> so as we look at the stages, we need to be sure we don't get a false sense of superiority. That if we find ourselves at a stage four or a stage five or even a stage six, we can then start identifying people at stage two or stage three or stage four especially in a climate of presidential races, you'll be able to look at mm -hmm. presidential candidates and go, ah, that's stage three language, that's stage four, that's stage one language. And it's easy to feel superior when you can label it and say, well, I'm a higher stage than them. But the reason that's dangerous is that in each of these stages, you will still have that remnant of the stage that is left with you. You are progressive, which means you cannot leap stages. That is the one thing that Gilligan holds to. That's the one thing that Kohlberg and Fowler hold to. You can't leap stages. But that does not mean that you will necessarily leave that stage entirely behind. And this is where Carol Gilligan really pushed Kohlberg, looking for a more sinusoidal pattern where you'll dip in and out of these stages as you progress up and down. Kohlberg saw a more linear pattern but we see in practice now that even if you are stage four, or stage five, you still have triggers. You have areas in your life where you will react like you are stage two or even stage one. It depends on what part, what area of your life you have allowed to develop, reflect on, and then grow. So with that as our preamble and our warning about stage theory, here are the basics of Kohlberg's stage theory. You start with stage one. And stage one, he says, is based off the idea of punishment, that you do what is right in order to avoid punishment. It's very basic. Don't do this or else I get a spanking. Don't do this or else I get sent to the corner. 
the only reason for me to do right is that to do wrong will incur a punishment, which means if I can get away with it without any degree of punishment, then it's automatically right. So it's a very basic level of understanding. Those that raise children or have worked with children, or those of us that may remember what it's like being a child, this is the basics. You know, don't do that or I'm going to get a spanking. There is no great concept of what is right or wrong. It is simply my butt's going to hurt or it's not. And that's what makes it right or wrong. So that's stage one. Stage two begins to move a little way from that. It's not strictly punishment based at this point. We move on. Oh, let me give you the titles for this, by the way. For those that want to be purely academic, <clears throat> not that there's anyone like that in this group, uh, stage one is called the pre-conventional. Stage two is where you move into individualism. And this is where you follow rules, but strictly through your own needs. This is where um, if it will get me what I want, then I'm happy to follow the rules. If it doesn't get me what I want, then I'm going to find my way around the rules. Rules are followed only in accordance to meeting our own needs. So that's stage two. It's no longer the punishment that moves us. It's our specific desire that will move us in line with those rules. And if the rules and our desires are in sync, then we follow those. That's an individualist ideal. You then move on to stage three. This is mutual interpersonal expectations. You can begin to see why I have to read these because they're such convoluted titles. <coughs> but the interpersonal part of this is where it's no longer strictly what I need versus the rule that you have offered me. The interpersonal part is that I now take into consideration what you think of me. So for a child, it is wanting to appear as the good child. This is where you hear language, I am good, I am bad. The very title of good or bad is what will then dictate that you want to be the good child, you want to be the good person, means that you want to follow this rule. It's no longer necessarily your need. I don't need to mow the lawn, but if dad says that I am a good kid, then I want that praise, and therefore I will go mow the lawn. You also begin to see a reliance or a callback to the golden rule at this point, because it's interpersonal. I will do what I think is good for me, because if I were in your position, then that is what will, um, that is what will relate to me. So if I knew I were in your shoes, I wouldn't want that to happen, and therefore I will do good to you because I would want you to be good to me in that action. So that interpersonal quality. And you can see where we moved from the strict individualism that we find in stage one and stage two to now one that relies more on a relationship. It's still a very limited relationship, though. It's not what society thinks is good. It's not what society thinks is bad. It's what very specific individuals will think of me, my best friends, my parents, my siblings. How will those people I know most and trust most, how do they relate to me? The random stranger on the street saying that's a good boy or a bad boy isn't going to relate to stage three. Then we move on to stage four. Stage four is the social system and consciousness. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there you go. When you have a social system and consciousness, this is where you move out of those specific relationships and you begin to see society in a larger form. You realize that society has laws, and these laws 
are necessary for the sake of society to function. These laws are beyond just being good or bad. These laws are necessary for society to exist. Um, without this, you have a breakdown. You have a chaos. Uh, you often hear at this point, why do I do right? Well, if I do wrong and someone else does wrong and someone else does wrong, then you have a breakdown. If everybody else did wrong, then we wouldn't have any order. So it's not so much laws that are based on any high ideal, but it's simply laws that are necessary to keep things in order. Um, again, we move from stage three into stage four because it's no longer what is good or bad as I'm seen, but it's simply what society has termed as right or wrong. So you begin to trust the societal norms for this. When you move from stage three into stage four, Kohlberg said this was typically the transition that would happen in adolescence or late adolescence going into adulthood. He was um, keen to point out, however, that you have a great many ad adults that do not transition from stage three to stage four. It is expected that you would, that you would have an understanding of societal norms that um, in order for me to function in society, I have to trust that the laws society has created are to my benefit. But Kohlberg pointed out, you have a great number of adults still that will operate out of, am I seen as good or am I seen as bad? Uh, for instance, and again, this is where it's compartmentalized in our lives, how many of us, I know from my own experience, in the professional world, I like to be praised by my superiors. If I have my boss come in and say, you did a really good job, I'm not going to do the work because I know it's going to get some great altruistic job done. I'm going to do it because my boss is going to come in and say, that is really good in the hopes that eventually there's a raise, but the idea that it's still individualistic, that would regress me back to stage three rather than stage four. But if we look at something on a greater scale, uh, why do I take out the garbage or why do I pick up litter outside? Why do I not litter, for instance, when I'm driving down the road? A stage four mentality would say, because we have laws. If everybody littered, then everything would be a mess, and we would have no mutual respect for society. Therefore, because the law says so, I have to do it. If it were stage three, it would be, I do not litter because someone's going to think I'm good, and I'm a good person because I'm not a litter bug. So it's the same action, but you have different intents, different reasoning that get you to it. And we're going to come back to that intention as defining the moral stages in a little bit. But we begin to see where the intention changes with similar actions. So from stage four, we then move on to stage five. This is a social contract or utility and individual rights. This is where you begin to have a more complex view of society. Originally, you had... <coughs> Um, in stage four, you have societal needs, laws, and therefore we keep laws so that we have society. In stage five, it's a bit more of a nuance. It's not so much don't do right because if we all do wrong, it all goes to shit. But we do right because the laws we have are what allow us to function, and these are based off of principles that I can trust. Uh, you have an obligation to that law because it's not just what they say, but it is your agreement to work within it. It's not something that is imposed upon you, but something that you willingly take part of. It is a subtle distinction. They both, stage four and stage five, agree that laws have to be followed. Stage four, however, follows laws because laws are there and it's automatic. Stage five actually takes a personal 
um, initiative in the law saying that my part in this society is that I have agreed to take part in this law. I'm sure you can imagine where in our own society the difference between stage four and stage five becomes very, very blurred. Everyone's following laws. Everyone knows to follow laws. But until you start uh, needling into the intention, you cannot tell by sheer outward expression what is your reasoning behind following that law. Is it because it's what we have to do and that's what keeps society together at stage four? Or is it because my own personal obligation and my own beliefs in a solid uh, relationship in society requires my commitment to following these laws? The other distinction between four and five is that in five you begin to see and recognize more universal rights, such as life and liberty. Stage four simply relies on the laws, and laws will protect people and protect society. In stage five, you begin to see where laws might come in conflict with these principles. You assume, though, that laws are made in order for society to function, and therefore laws have to be beneficial, have to be benevolent. But it is not until stage six which is the universal ethical principle. It's not until stage six that you see that there are universal ethics, life, liberty, um, the pursuit of happiness, if you want to take the American ideal. Um, but these universal principles that do not necessarily follow the laws that we have, and when they are in conflict, then the universal principles always have to take precedence. That is the difference between stage six and stage five. That when these universal principles are in conflict with the laws, stage five might follow the universal principle, but they are also just as likely to follow the law because the law is their obligation. The law is the contract that I made with society, and even if it might feel wrong, it's the obligation I made. If you are citing universal principles, then that puts you at stage six. Stage five and stage six, also beginning in stage four, you begin to have a more, uh, you have a, had a greater understanding of different societal norms. This really comes out in stage five and into stage six, but we realize that my societal norms, which I have agreed to, might be different from your societal norms that my societal norms here in America might not be the societal norms of Canada, might not be the societal norms of Nigeria, might not be the societal norms of Vietnam, that their own cultural differences will make that uh, societal difference. And because I have obligated to my societal norms, then these are the norms I will follow. And because you have different societal norms, it does not necessarily mean your difference makes it wrong. Stage five into stage six appreciates that difference and recognizes that difference does not mean deficient in that. So those are the, the six basic stages that we have. When Carol Gilligan was a student of Kohlberg, <coughs> she looked at these theories and she particularly looked at the way that Kohlberg was testing these. And this is where I want to bring up again uh, the difference between intention and action. And this is how Kohlberg defined uh, his moral stages or how he would define someone's moral stage. The way it was figured out is you, were, you would be given a series of dilemmas. Now, a dilemma is where you have two options from which you have to choose. You have to make a choice. Because even inaction will cause an outcome. And in either case, something bad will happen. That there is no avoiding a negative outcome within the dilemma. So you have to choose from the lesser of two evils, as it were. Kohlberg would designate your moral stage by the reasoning you would come to at the end of your dilemma. One of his famous dilemmas is uh, the, the pharmacist 
dilemma, which goes like this. You have a loved one who is suddenly diagnosed with stage four cancer. They are sure to die in their, in their current circumstance. There is no drug readily on the market that we know of that will save them. As it happens down the street, you have a neighbor who is a pharmacist, and he has been doing research on this particular kind of cancer for many, many years, has invested time and in, in insane amounts of money in order to come up with this new discovery. He just found a cure that has a 100% um, cure rate, 100% likelihood of curing your loved one from the stage four cancer. It costs all of $100 to produce this pill. He is charging $5,000 for the pill. You have all of $2,000. You do not have enough money to buy this pill. So you go up to the pharmacist and you say, pharmacist, friend, neighbor, my wife is dying, my loved one, my partner, my brother, my sister, whoever it is, my loved one is dying, they have this, you have the cure, here's the money I have, can I do it in layaway, I'll come back and work, you know, what is it, what can we do so I can get this drug? And the pharmacist says, nope, I have people lined up around the block, I have a limited supply, I put the investment in, I put the time in, and I can choose whatever price I want, and unless you had the full 5000 right here and now, no go. So here's the dilemma that Kohlberg presents. You know, with your loved one dying and the pharmacist down the street, you know where the pharmacist keeps this drug. You know how to get to it, and you know that the pharmacist leaves his back door unlocked in his office. <coughs> the dilemma is this. Do you break the law and steal the drug in order to save your loved one? Or do you obey the law, not steal the drug, and let your loved one die? As you would reason it out, as people would reason out this dilemma, the reasoning they used for it, whether or not, well, if I take it and I break a law, then I'm bad. Well, that puts you back at stage three. Or you could say, the law is important, but right to life, everyone has a universal right to life, and life is more important than law, then you're angling towards stage five. If, however, you said, well, they're a loved one, and I, they have a right to life, and if they died, I would be sad. It's no longer stage five. You've now moved back down to stage one and two mm -hmm. because it's now personal loss, individual loss, no longer their right, their benefit, or even a universal right. You could have someone choose both to steal the drug as well as not to steal the drug, and their reasoning could put both of them at stage six. Just as you could choose either and wind up at stage one for both. It was all the reasoning that you used. Did you rely on personal effect? Did you rely on personal relationship? Did you rely on societal norms? Was it a breakdown of society that you were afraid of? or was it your obligation to society that you relied on? Whatever it was, that is how he would classify you. And there were others <coughs> that went with it. There were other dilemmas that you can look up, and they're fun to play with. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to put into groups, especially Sunday schools, and have them argue out morality on what is right and what is wrong. If you ever want a fun Sunday morning, get a bunch of adults together at a church, give them a dilemma, and have them argue why they're right or wrong for what they did. Just sit back and watch. Not that I'm an instigator or anything, or have done this, but, you know, it's fun. So that was Kohlberg's um, stage theory. 
with those explanations that people gave, Carol Gilligan, his student, began to see a trend that women as a whole typically would uh, be graded at a lower stage than men. And she wondered why. She started looking at the language that was being used. And Kohlberg relies a lot on societal norms. That community and societal standards are what define the individual and the higher morality. That if you are basing it on strictly relationship, that puts you at a lower norm. Carol Gilligan then countered that, saying that from a feminist perspective, the language that is used for a feminist or for a woman is actually more relationship-based. The relationship between a mother and a child, the relationship between a wife and a husband, friend, sister, etc., that typically the language is more relationship-based. And because of that, the system that Kohlberg set up was automatically against women in the language that they would use. So Carol Gilligan came up with her own stage theory that is, technically it's three stages, but there are halfway points between the three, so you have five stages that you can work through. Her stages are not necessarily um, progressional. She did try to say that it was more sinusoidal. But then when you read her work, and her own explanations, there's still the understanding, the basic assumption that you should be moving from stage one to stage two and the best is stage three. That even Carol Gilligan couldn't quite get out of it. Um, but hers, similar to uh, Kohlberg, was simply a progression that was based around relationship language, <clears throat> which I can go to or I'll put in a link after the video um, and you can follow up and look up Carol Gilligan. So it was these stages showing that you can define someone's development and clearly delineate that stage with the language that you choose, whether you're talking about relationship or um, society. And that, that clear distinction would place people in a progression uh, for their moral development. In that progression in stage theory is what James Fowler then embraced and simply applied language of faith to as opposed to language of morality. So for Kohlberg and Gilligan, no matter which one you look at, the progression always remains the same. You cannot skip steps. You can always look at someone who is stage one and see that they will progress to stage two and that the next one they come to will have to be stage three. They will not go from three to five because the development itself requires that formation from stage to stage. And that is what I want you to hold on to when we move into James Fowler next week. And when we look at Fowler, we're going to look at, um, we're not going to do all of his stages in one go. We're going to look at his first three stages, maybe two, next week analyze where we see it in our own denominations and churches now, and then we'll look at the subsequent um, three and four, and we'll probably save five for the last one, to see how it develops, and then what that means for church and conversation with those that are one stage conversing with another. So that is the, the basics of stage theory. That's the basics of Kohlberg. Um, any thoughts? comments, questions that we have, which will allow me to drink my tea now. So, so I assume it's a good idea to try to help one go from stage to stage? That's a really good question. Um, and this is where I said we have to be careful. Because it is a progression, and because it's a stage from one to six, there is the assumption, especially in Kohlberg, that we should be moving people along. The problem with that is, and we'll see this more in Fowler than we do in this, but if someone is at stage four and it works for them, 
and they are operating within the norms of society they are it is good for them it is good for those around them and stage four thinking works mm -hmm. then there's no reason to push them to stage five uh, same with stage three to stage four even if someone is operating fine they are healthy member of family and society at stage three thinking then it is not necessary to push them to stage four um, where this will really come into an issue is when we look at stages of faith because the progressions of moral development with Fowler is at least according to Fa uh, to Kohlberg rather to Kohlberg is pretty standard you're automatically going to progress this way in society because society has a standard and will expect you by adulthood to reach that standard just in conversation with people that you have only distinction between three and four because you have adults that don't make it to three or make it out of three to four necessarily um, but they're still good members of society now Kohlberg would say higher level thinking would require you to move from stage four to stage five and knowing that there is a progression you should probably push yourself to it the problem in saying that if we know someone should move we should try to move them is that some people will only move when they are ready to move and to push someone past their stage past that level before they're ready is especially in stages of faith damaging not quite as much with moral stage theory I would necessarily say though even that if you try to push someone into a, a different I mean if you're going from an individualist or a strictly relational mindset trying to teach a 12 year old about societal norms and universal values you're either going to confuse the hell out of the kid um, or to quote the the great social philosopher Mark Twain it's kind of like teaching a pig to sing you're gonna waste your time and you're really going to annoy the pig that if they're not ready to move, then they're not going to move. Uh, and this goes back more towards the cognitive development that any you know, psychiatrist or therapist will be able to say, the mind will move when the mind is ready to move. Where this... And, yeah. and, and if you're looking at someone else's moral development, how can you tell if they're ready to move? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, you will begin to see or hear the language start to come out. You will begin to hear it's no longer strictly relational, but they'll start talking about social constraints, social norms, or laws for the sake of laws, as opposed to um, I'm a good boy, I'm a bad boy. You know, I'm a good person, I'm a good member of society because I follow laws. That's stage three thinking. I follow laws because without them, life is going to fall apart. That's stage four. I follow laws because it's my obligation as a member of this society to partake. That's stage five. That my laws are based off of universal norms. And when they are in conflict, I should still follow a universal norm. And that's stage six. You begin to hear the language that comes out of it. Um, and uh, the neat thing is when you do the, the moral dilemmas and you run through them you might wind up as a stage 5 on one moral dilemma and you might wind up as a stage 3 on another moral dilemma yeah. because it's again our lives are compartmentalized and Kohlberg when he went through these you would average them all together to figure out right about where you were but as stage theory progressed, we began to see, well, in this part of my life, I'm stage two. I haven't moved. Nothing has pushed me beyond that. And that's typically what will move you from one stage to the next. There's an outside impetus or some personal experience that is in conflict with your current mindset that forces you to reconsider and therefore see something different. 
when we move into stage theory for uh, stages of faith next week and the week following, this will be a big point that I'm going to harp on when we reach stage four and stage five. Because to move from one to the other, especially, or stage three to stage four, rather, to move from stage three to stage four, you have to have crisis. And to force crisis on someone is, in one way, it's arrogant to think that I can make someone move. And in another way, it is manipulative to take that responsibility and try to make that happen. Um, so, again, we'll, we'll hear this warning again when we hit Fowler. Um, but that's an excellent question. And that was one of the considerations that Gilligan had. She said, Kohlberg is too linear, so we should make it sinusoidal. We shouldn't expect people to move. And in fact, if you move to stage five, that doesn't mean you won't regress again to stage six. If you have a crisis, you might in fact rely not on your highest understanding, your highest moral thinking. You're going to regress back to the one that has worked before. Uh, so it, it's very fluid at that point, depending on what we're doing. But excellent question. Any other thoughts or comments for us? Matthew, have you any? I see we're good. Well, as we wrap up with stage theory, I want you to consider continuing uh, to mull that over. If you have any questions, bring them up next week before we hit Fowler. But in the meantime, let us wrap up with Compline, starting on page 127. Let us attend, Lord Almighty, grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm 31. In you, o Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me. For you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne, and illumine this night with your celestial brightness, that by night as by day your people may glorify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, your unfailing providence sustains the world we live in and the life we live. Watch over those both night and day who work while others sleep and grant that we may never forget that our common life depends upon each other's toil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray to you, Lord, for all those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, for Enoch, for Josh, for Brother Francis Boniface, We pray for those who are in need, for the homeless and hungry, for the poor, the destitute, the persecuted and imprisoned, for those suffering from famine, from war, and from natural disasters, especially those in Houston and elsewhere in Texas affected by the torrential rains and flooding. In your compassion, Lord, we pray to you for those who this night are dying. May they find comfort, solace, and peace. And in your mercy, Lord, we pray to you for all those who have died, especially those in the recent shootings. Receive them into your care. Let us pray for those who hold authority throughout the world, for the leaders of our nations and our communities. We pray for those who hold authority in our churches, for our patriarchs, archbishops, and bishops. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, 
those bishops supporting our order, Rob and Keith of Atlanta, Andy, Dina, and Jeff of Texas, Neil at Swanee, and Dorsey, our bishop visitor. And we pray for all priests, deacons, monastics, and laity, that together we may be the body of Christ on earth. We give thanks to you, Lord, for all the many blessings of this life. I invite any other prayers, petitions, or thanksgivings, whether spoken or silent. For all our prayers, Lord, those spoken and unspoken, those which we bear in our hearts that are known truly to you alone, we ask that he is in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may lost with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free. To go in peace as you have promised, that his eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God's peace, Matthew. God's peace, everyone else watching. Look forward to seeing you next week.